I want you to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 5. I'm not, I'm not preaching out of that. I just want to see if it's in your version. Isaiah chapter 5. <coughs> oh, let's pick it up about verse 27. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall uh, slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. Whose arrows are sharp, and all their bows bent, their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like a young lion. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away, away safe, and none shall deliver it. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, it is good to be saved. It really is. And God... Really, Lord, I'll bet you, God, I'll bet you there's somebody here that didn't even feel like coming. And they just came because whatever reason they thought they should be here. I know this, God, you gotta be blessed by people that come through the door on a Monday night. And I hope every person walking through the door tonight, that was an act of worship for you, I really do. I hope you bless these people for their attendance. I don't mean bless them with this message. I mean just bless them, God, in general, for being in church tonight. But also pray, God, that the message will be a blessing, that it will be a help, uh, that it will be uh, in some way, God, it will edify the church, that the church would then in turn glorify thee. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, It says there, look at verse 29 again. Their roaring shall be like a lion, they shall roar like young lions, yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. Now, I told you the other night, uh, I, I know I told, I think I told the men this, I don't know if I told all you guys this, but when you read your Bible, get out of your, get out of your chair, get out of your house, blah, blah, get it. I don't want to get into that verse. <laughs> I don't want to be the prey. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but most of what is eaten in the wild is eaten alive. You know, a lion does not, it is not, you know, bite it and then go, take his pulse, we don't want it to suffer. I mean, much of, much of what is eaten by a lion is eaten while it is calling for its mom. Right? And that has got to be a horrible thing. And lions are not known for their compassion. Is that not true? I mean, you know, that is just not one of those things that, you know, lions are just such compassionate animals. They're, they're just so motherly. Maybe mother and lawly, but anyway. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk to you tonight because uh, I don't want to be in that verse. I don't want to be at the mercy of something that has no mercy. Right? I don't want to be at the mercy of a lion. And there, I'm going to talk to you about tonight about some lions that you need to be aware of. Okay, just kind of keep an eye out and stay away. Uh, some time ago, some bonehead jumped into the lion pit at a zoo. And the reason he did that, gives a woman, this woman jumped into this lion pit because she was going to let them know that she was their friend. She wasn't their friend, she was their supper. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the whole human race went up a couple notches in the gene pool when that happened. But I'm going to talk to you tonight about some lions that you need to be aware of. I want you to go first with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. First lion I'm going to tell you to beware of is the roaring lion. Obviously, the roaring lion is the devil. Now, sometimes we preachers fall into a trap, and the trap is that we talk about a subject like we know everything there is about it. And I don't know everything there is about lions. What I know, some of it is built on prejudice. Anything that big with those kind of claws and sharp teeth, I figure is pretty bad, Okay. But, uh, but they tell me that, a, that a, a lion will literally low crawl. Uh, it will low crawl and be as silent as a shadow until it is about to spring and then it'll roar. And part of the reason it roars is because it literally, the, the, the roar of a lion, they say, will literally just terrify you and freeze you in your spot, gives that lion that much more time to get you. So the roaring lion is the devil. And I want you to know about the roaring lion. The, lo- the roaring lion is the lion that will hunt you. Uh, there were two lions in Africa a number of years ago. I think it was in the, it was in the late 19th century. <clears throat> they're building a they're building a railroad, uh, and they had these two lions. They're called the uh, Man Eaters of Tsavo, uh, S T S A V O, uh, and they called them the Ghost and the Darkness. 
And these lions were so bold that these men would be working on the railroad tracks and a lion would literally, this was, you know, he was, they weren't bashful, would jump down, snatch a guy up and just run off uh, into, the, into the jungle and eat him. Uh, and in fact, they made a movie called, I think, The Ghost of the Darkness. How many of you have seen it? What are you doing going to the movie? <laughs> I got to change my message. Man, I love to do that. I'm sorry. I just, I, I, that is my flesh. I just love to set you up. Anyway, um, I read a report. I read a book. I read a book on the, uh, of the, uh, the man eaters of Savo. And I was telling, remember I was telling you last night uh, about the, the, the thorns and briars were used like barbed wire? Well, what they did was the, the crews that were working on this railroad, their encampment was surrounded by, by, they just piled, I mean, this high, they piled thorns and briars to keep these lions out. And they said, these lions, this one lion literally low crawled through the briars, came up to a tent where, where a worker was sleeping, where the native workers were sleeping, grabbed him in the, in the midsection with his jaws, and then, you know, think about this. The guy's alive and used him as a, as a bulldozer blade to break through the thorns on the way out and then ate him. Now, that is just purely bad news. <laughs> I mean, there's just, no, there's just no nice way to look at that. I always worry about people that try to dress up serpents and lions as something nice, and they're not. <clears throat> so, guys, the, the, uh, the roaring lion is the lion that will hunt you. And I've often thought that the, the devil is kind of like a sniper. He'll sit for a long time, but he'll take one shot. Boy, that's the one that does it. Now, this lion can be dealt with and can be defeated. Now, how do you defeat the devil? Pardon me? How do you make him flee from you? That's what I thought. That's what I thought you'd say. And I didn't mean to set you up, but I did. Um, we always say that. Take a look at James chapter 4. <clears throat> We often say, resist the devil and he will flee from you, correct? That is not what the verse says. It says, verse 7, the first half, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And we get this idea, you know, if the devil's around, just plead the blood, plead the blood, plead the blood, you know, and, and we want to resist the devil, but that isn't what the verse says. The verse says first, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. I got a feeling there's something in us that does not want to submit ourselves to God. So we ignore the first half of that verse. Uh, here's what happens. <clears throat> you get a knock on the back door, and you go to the back door, and it's the devil. You say, uh, what do you want? He, said, he says, I'm the devil. And he said, I want you to worship me, and I want you to submit yourself to me, and I want to run your life. Now, I know if that happened to any one of you, you know what you'd say? Oh, no, oh, no, plead the blood, plead the blood. You close the door and, and there's a knock at the front door. And you go and there's God. And you go, oh, hey, God, what do you want? He said, I want you to worship me and I want you to submit yourself to me and I want to run your life. Now, the reason you didn't want the devil to, to run your life is because he might mess up your plans for your life, right? He might ruin your life. I mean, the plans you have for it, correct? So you look at God and say, could you go away? See, you might ruin my plans for my life too. I don't want the devil running my life because he may alter the plans that I have for it, but I don't want God running my life because he may alter the plans that I have for it too. And to be very honest, I want you to leave me alone, and I want you to leave me alone, but I'll tell you what, you stick around because if the kids get sick, I'm going to call you. Now, that is the truth, is it not? Guys, one of the hardest things in life is to simply submit yourself to God because you may not like what you have to submit yourself to. Um, I, I broke my neck <clears throat> in 1973 uh, and uh, I worked for a couple of months with it broken because my doctor was definitely practicing medicine. <laughs> and trust me, that guy never did get it perfected. <clears throat> and so they finally, uh, <coughs> they finally fixed it <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they finally fixed it. You know, they, uh, this guy got to do to me what a bunch of Christians wanted to do for years. He cut my throat. And I woke up. Uh, I, they had drilled two holes here, and they'd hung this uh, 20 pounds off the top of my head and ran it through a sidebar of this bed. Uh, I was in a circle electric bed, and what they would do is every four hours, uh, they'd flip this thing over, and so for four hours, I'm looking at the ceiling for floor. And, and because the rope went through the sidebar of the bed, I was part of the bed. 
And I was in that bed for a month. Do you have any idea how glad I was to see a bathroom? Oh, anyway, so, um, <clears throat> and, and here's the problem. There was a danger when I went into surgery that I would wake up paralyzed from the neck down. That's what the doctor had to tell me. He said, there is a chance. He said, we do this surgery often and everything should be fine, but there is a chance that you could, you could be paralyzed from the, from the neck down. And as you can see, I am not paralyzed from the neck down. I've got some friends that think I'm paralyzed from the neck up. But I woke up from that surgery and I was okay and I could move my hands and I could move my legs and I could move my arms and everything was just fine, except I could not speak. I couldn't talk. And I remember telling God this. I, I can still remember to this day. I'm face down. I am looking at the, at the green and black checkerboard asbestos, yes, asbestos, tile floor of room 237 of Doctor's Hospital. And right below this part of me is a puddle of tears about that big. And I remember saying this to God. I said, God, if I would have been paralyzed from the neck down, I could have preached from a wheelchair. You gave me back my body and took the one thing I had to have to preach. You took my voice. And I, and I didn't understand. Come on, has God ever done anything in your life you didn't quite understand? Has God ever done anything in your life you didn't quite appreciate? And I had to resolve that. And here was, the, here was how I resolved that. Here's what I believe. Tell me if I'm wrong. When you love somebody, I mean when you love them, don't you want them to be happy? All right, I tell you, I love the Lord. I really do. I, I got a lot of shortcomings, a lot of problems, but I'm telling you, I love the Lord. And I'm, I'm laying there looking at the floor, and I said, I love you, Lord. And I said, you took my voice away. But if you took my voice away, that must mean you did what you wanted to do. And if you did what you wanted to do, that must make you happy. So, Lord, if me not speaking makes you happy, I surrender never to speak again. They say, oh, I bet your voice came back. Nope. But my joy came back. It was four more months, or it was actually, yes, yeah, it's four more months before my voice came back. They were getting ready to do a surgery on my vocal cords, uh, and, and my voice came back. But what I'm saying is sometimes we don't want to submit ourselves to God because we don't like what we see. But the Bible doesn't say to resist the devil and flee from you. It says submit yourselves therefore to God, then resist the devil. So here's how this goes. The devil's knocking on one door saying, let me run your life. God's knocking on the other door saying, let me run your life. So what you do is you go to the front door and say, Lord, you really want my life? Yeah, you want to run it? Yeah, you know you might mess up my plans? He says, yeah, I, I fully intend to mess up your plans. Do you know what my plans were for my life? I wanted my own body shop. That was the whole dream. I, I had one dream. I wanted my own body shop. I could have lived and died painting cars, metal flakes and flame jobs and all that stuff. Uh, I would have, I, that would have been fine. Boy, did God mess up my life. Or I shouldn't say my life. He messed up my plans for my life. So here's what you need to do. You need to go to God. Go to the front door. Say, Lord, you want my life. You want me to submit myself to you, right? Trust you to run my life like you could do a better job than me. And he said, yeah. Then take your life and say, okay, I submit myself to you. I give you my life. It's yours. Run it as you wish. Go to the back door. Oh, devil, what is it you wanted again? I want your life. That's what I thought. You wanted me to submit myself to you, right? Yep, yep. So you want my submission and you want my life, correct? And you want my worship. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Oh, hey, you know what? Can't give it to you. I gave it to God. Go ask him for it. Where are you going? Where are you, what are you fleeing from? Guys, you need to submit yourselves to God before you resist the devil. You can't resist the devil until you, until you submit yourself to God. And so the roaring lion is the lion that will hunt you down. And, and you know, you guys that hunt, do you not know your prey? Come on, do you not know, you know where it's going to go through the woods? Uh, you know how to lay a trap for it, how to draw it in. Isn't that true? And if you've been hunting for 15 or 20 or 25 years, you should be pretty good at it. What do you think has somebody been doing it for 4,000 years? You know, the devil is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. But you go to the doctor and the doctor says, uh, you say, doc says, how you feel? You say, well, you know, um, I, got a, I got a little pain here on my left side and I got a metallic taste here uh, and I'm, I'm not sleeping very good and my eyes are bloodshot. And he says, oh, here's what you got. You go, boy, you're really smart. So know the last 400 people that came in with those symptoms, this is what they had, right? He ain't that smart. 
Those things don't look related to us, but he said, oh yeah, the last 400 people over the 20 some years I've been doing this, when they came in with those symptoms, this is what they had. Sure enough, that's what you got. When, when, when the devil has been watching humanity for 4,000 years, you think he doesn't have an idea of where you're going through the woods? And what, what, you will, what will stop you in your tracks and go, whoa, look at that. So what you have to do, you are not smarter than the devil, guys. But God is. You are not more powerful than the devil. But God is. So your only hope is to submit yourself to him. Then resist the devil. And he will flee from you. But there is another one. Go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. First Kings chapter 13. And you know this story. <coughs> this is right after Jeroboam put up his, um, put up his, uh, his altars there in, in uh, Dan and Bethel and put up those golden calves. And it says this in verse one, behold, there came a man uh, of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto, unto the house of David, Josiah by name. That's pretty pointed prophecy, is it not? And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense unto, upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, of which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, lay hold on him. So here's what happens. He's over here making this, this, this offering to an abominable God, a false God. Of all things, man, it's the same golden calf that, the, that they had out there in the 40 years in, in the wilderness. And you, know, you know, it's one thing to put up a false God. It's another to call the false God the real thing. You know, it was not just amazing to me that they made a golden calf, but then they said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. It wasn't the God that brought them out of Egypt. And so this guy, he pronounces this prophecy against the altar, and Jeroboam says, lay hold on him. And look what happens. And his hand, which he had put forth against him, dried up, so he could not pull it in again to him. So it's like this. Now he can't move it. Now that would get your attention, would it not? That would definitely get your attention. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be, may, may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. So here's what he said. He's, he's like this, and he said, Will you please... Ask God to make my hand like my other one. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> Look at verse seven. And the king said to the man, uh, man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself. Now he's not allowed to do this, is he? And he probably said, oh no, no. And he said, and I will give thee a reward. Oh no, 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 no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't get me to come home with you if you bought me a Viper GTS. <laughs> Just in case you're looking to bribe me or even a challenger would do. And the man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. You wonder if he was fishing there. Uh, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord saying, eat no bread nor drink water, nor turn again by the same, uh, same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, believe it or not, what happens next happens across this country and has been happening for decades. Now, the, there dwelt an old prophet. Does it say an old worshiper of Baal? Does it say like an old uh, devil? This guy was a prophet. This, this is somebody God used at one time, Correct. Correct? Now, either he has retired or God has retired him. But for whatever purpose, this guy is no longer a prophet. He's an old prophet. He's out of business. There was an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came. Let me ask you this. Stop and think about this. Wasn't this guy already in Bethel? 
Why didn't God call his number and say, will you go across town and curse an altar for me? So whatever it is about this guy, he's a goner. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man, the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, uh, them they told also to their father. And the father, uh, their father said unto them, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, uh, which came from Judah. And he said to his, his son, saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak, and said unto him, <clears throat> art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. Now, you know what this guy wants? He just wants to be where the action is again. He wants to be where the action is. You know what he wants? He wants to be where somebody God's using again. Was there not a time when God used him? You better believe it. You understand how, must, how horrible it must be to not be used anymore? So he said, look, just, I just want to have supper with you. Just come on home. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said, uh, said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way uh, that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. You probably, heard, you probably heard my name. I might have signed your Bible when you were a kid. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. You know what the old prophet gave the young man of God? A new version of the word of God. Did he not? Did this kid not know exactly what the word of God said? But, well, come on, kid. I mean, you know, I've been preaching longer than you are old. And, and you know, I know the Greek. And you don't know the Greek like I know the Greek. You don't know the Hebrew like I know the Hebrew. And I hate to tell you that I'm, I love the old KJV. But a better translation is this. Whoa, man, yeah, you know, I better, I better follow you. Many a young man has been slain, not by the devil, but by an old used up prophet that got him a new version of the word of God. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water and it came to pass. Now watch this. As they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back and he cried unto the man of God and, uh, that came from Judah saying, thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say unto thee, say to thee, eat no bread and drink no water there, uh, no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. Now, wait a minute. You know what this old prophet just did? He just got what he wanted. He just got used of God again. Did he not? This is the God that bypassed him for the young man of God to go curse the altar, Correct? And the very man that deceived him with a new translation is the man that told him, you're cooked. And it came to pass after he'd eaten bread and after he had drunk and he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet who, had, who he had brought back. And, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. I call this lion the stalking lion. And I'll tell you when this lion kills you. This lion kills you when you enter its territory. I was talking with the guys uh, yesterday morning, <clears throat> and I tell people, I said, you know, uh, I might have used this illustration. There may be a bar in town, and it has the best deep fried shrimp basket in town. And you're going to go in there, and you're going to have a, a shrimp basket and a Coke. You know, that's just really not the place to get the best shrimp basket in town. Because that may just be bad for you. And then you end up, you know, uh, messing your life up permanently for the Lord and going, I just don't understand it. I just went in there for a shrimp basket. Yeah, but you went into the, to the territory of the stalking lion. There are some places you just ought to stay out of. And you know what they are? I'm not even going to tell you. You know what I'm not going to tell you? Because I could give you a list of obvious ones, but there are some that you and I don't even know what they are. You know, I, I was telling somebody some time ago, if there's any, if I, I don't have a complaint. I do not have a complaint against my God. But if I could change one thing about him, you know what I would eliminate right now? 
that still small voice thing. I have had it to hear with the still small voice. I don't know how many, I don't know how many highway reconstruction plans I've donated to because a still small voice said, slow down around this next turn. And, and just after I signed the slip that is going to help me donate to this highway <clears throat> refurbishing plan, I say, oh, that was you. You know, I can always tell it was God right after I get the ticket. Have you ever, you know, right after the two by four hits you upside the head, you go, oh, that was God. That, that was. You'd better duck. I really, I kind of would like a bullhorn. Slow down! <laughs> you know, God could get my attention with one word, radar! <laughs> and suddenly I would feel like driving by law, not by grace. That's still a small voice. You ever walk into a place that did not look bad? I'm not talking about you walked into a bar. I'm not talking about you went in some shady place. You ever walk into a place and that little voice said, uh, you need to get out of here. Yeah. How come it is that every person in here would like to, have to, have to say, I know God spoke to me, and then when he does speak to you, you don't like what he said? You don't go where the stalking lion is and the stalking lion cannot get you. Uh, as I said, many people who fell into sin didn't fall into sin at all. They took a stroll through a minefield and couldn't understand why they blew a leg off. That's what they did. Guys, you are, most of you are adults, are you not? I mean, most of the people I'm talking to, you are adults. You actually feed yourself with sharp things and don't have four holes in your face, so you're apparently hitting your mouth, correct? So you're doing pretty good. And you know when a still small voice says, you ain't got any business here. What are you doing? You know, I, I tell this joke. I'll go into a restaurant, you know, and there's this music. <laughs> and, and I'll go, uh, I'll go, Kathy, isn't that CD we just bought? And, the, and, the, and usually the, person, the preacher with me goes, I'll go, oh, we got the Christian words. Well, come on, come on. How many of you listen to garbage? You're listening to garbage, but they're singing about Jesus. Well, tell them to stop. Yeah. You know, if I take a piece of wood and we take a router and in that piece of wood, we route into that piece of wood, Jesus Christ the Lord. Is that not the greatest name in the universe? Now I take that piece of wood and I go out to a mud puddle and I stir that mud puddle with that piece of wood. Can I ask you a question? Have I sanctified the mud? Come on, is the mud now holy? Did I not put the greatest name there is in that mud? Have I made the mud holy? Have I made the name dirty? So how come you're listening to stuff that makes the name dirty? Well, I like that kind of music. Who said you should listen to what you like? I'm going to tell you something. I have no answer to this question and I'm not looking for it. I don't know, as I stand here, I don't know if I don't still like the taste of beer. I may still like the taste of beer. I quit drinking it 40 years ago when I got saved because I knew I shouldn't be drinking it. I, but what if I drank a little beer? But I like it. Well, who said you ought to do what you like? Good night, man. You like darkness. And you know why. So guys... Stay out of where that, stay away from the sin, stay out of the territory where the stalking lion is. I was telling these guys, you know, preachers, they'll go out there and they'll buy 14 rock CDs. Well, I'm going to preach against it. Get out of here. You ain't preaching against it. You want an excuse to listen to it. I was telling those guys, I had a, a, a guy who was in Bible college when I was in Bible college. And, and the bad movie when I was in Bible college was Rosemary's Baby. It was a bad movie. I know what it's about. I've not seen it. I'm not interested in it. But I think I know where her son is today think about that one. Anyway, and, um, and I, a fellow student, he said, well, I'm going to go see Rosemary's Baby. And I said, well, we don't go to movies. Why are you going to go see Rosemary's Baby? He said, I want to preach against it. He said, I can't very well preach against it if I don't know what it's like. What do you think? I said, well, I hope you never want to preach against adultery. <laughs> hope you never want to preach against drug addiction. And if he ever wants to preach against queers, I don't want to be around for the research.
Here's what I'm telling you. You don't have to study Satanism. You don't have to study every vile, you don't have to study witchcraft. You don't have to study every vile thing that is going on. on oh, I'm just going on the internet because I just want to see what's out there. I want to preach against I want to know how bad it is. Why do you want to know how bad it is? You don't know it's bad? You don't have to go out on the internet to find out how bad it is. Just sit in a restaurant and look at what walks past you and try to figure out what it was. And why it wanted to look like that. Man, I knew our country was cooked two weeks after this man was elected president when I look on the news and here we've just, we just voted in the president's probably going to put the nail in the coffin of the United States and here's the news, a thousand teenage girls going to see a, this is what the news called it, romantic vampire movie. Are you allowed to use those words in the same sentence? And some of you are reading the books. Well, I just want to be entertained by vampires. What's wrong with you that that's entertaining to you? Why, why some guy riding, riding around on a broom and casting spells? Could you tell me why that's entertaining to you? Why people eating people is entertaining to you? Because I'm telling you something. If that's entertaining to you, you got a serious problem tonight. And I'll tell you where you are. You are in the territory where the stalking lion is. He's going to nail you. There is plenty to read. There is plenty to watch if you've got to watch something. And it doesn't have to be that. And you don't have to be entertained. You, you know when I hear that, well, I just need to be entertained. I just want to be entertained. You know what I see every time I see that? I see this. You ever see a baby, what, I don't know what they are. A bassinet or whatever they are, but this thing, and then they got this thing stretched across there, and it's got a little thing that goes honk honk, right? And the kid lays there going honk honk. You know what the kids doing? Being entertained, right? Well, I don't have any problem with that. He's a baby, and then I walk in. I walk in. I walk in a Christian guy's house, and there's the boat. There's nothing wrong with the boat. And there's the snow skis, and there's the golf clubs, and there's the tennis racket. And then there's every ungodly thing that Hollywood ever produced. Because they have to be entertained. Maybe I was wrong. I thought I was talking to adults. And it's babies that have to be entertained. But even babies know that that horror stuff they ought to stay away from. Guys, stay out of the territory of the stalking lion. And he won't get you. But there's another one. Look at 2 Kings chapter 17. And if you cannot, as I read this, if you cannot superimpose the United States of America on this passage, maybe the future of the United States, you know that um, <clears throat> as God began to take his hand off the nation of Israel, the nations around Israel began to encroach uh, and, and conquer Israel and take people away. And it came to this in verse 24, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24, and the king of Syria brought men from Babylon and from Cutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. So here's what happened. The king of Syria came in and, and attacked and conquered Israel. Then they took the people of Israel out of Israel in Israel in an attempt at genocide, because that's what the Arabs have always wanted to do to the Jews. Then they went and got people from other countries that he'd conquered, and he put them. That is why there's a problem in Israel today. And he, brought, he, put, he transplanted them, so he put them in, in, the, in the land of Israel, and he took the Jews out of Israel and scattered them every place. But look what it says. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord... Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Now, why did God send these lions? Look what it says. Wherefore, they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria, now watch, know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests uh, whom you brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests 
whom they had carried away from Samaria, came and dwelt in uh, Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. That, that piece of ground over there that we know as Israel, let me tell you about that piece of ground. God gave that to his people. That makes him the God of that land. And when, when the king of Assyria took those people out of there, they couldn't get rid of the God of the land. Now I want you to know there's only one other nation in history, Israel and this one, that ever claimed the God of this book. You live in the single only nation that at its inception chose the God of the Bible. I told you the greatest thing that Patrick Henry ever said is not give me liberty or give me death. The greatest thing that Patrick Henry ever said was this. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians, not on religions but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our founding fathers sat around a table one day and they said, we're going to start a new country. And they looked toward heaven and said, we want you to be our God. And boy, I'm telling you, I say it before, man, if God had a switch, it flipped it right there. Do you know the two things Israel and, and, and the United States have in common? Neither have a pagan history. There is no pagan history to Israel. There is not a time when Israel was a pagan, heathen people that converted to Judaism. They were the beginning of Judaism, correct? America has no pagan history. The people that were on this continent prior to our arrival were heathen. But there's, there's never been a time there was a pagan America, except maybe now. You know, England, you could call it a Christian nation, but there was a time when they had the Druids and human sacrifices and all the paganism and the heathenism, correct? We have no pagan history. In fact, here's how this works. And by the way, when I say that this is the only nation that chose the God of the Bible, don't, don't tell me Israel did. Israel did not choose God. God chose Israel. And I still think they're God's chosen people. But this is the only nation Every other nation, with the exception of Israel, every other nation was pagan and had to be Christianized. This one is Christian and had to be paganized. And the goal of public education and the goal of, I'm sorry, but Boise State and Harvard and Yale and every college and every university in this country, the goal is to paganize the population. And I tell you, man, they've succeeded. You say, well, what's going to happen? Well, there's still a problem here. You know what the problem is? This God is the God of this land. And they can't change that. And you can talk all you want about Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus. And hey, five times a day right now, five times a day, they are calling Muslims to prayer publicly in Dearborn, Michigan. I didn't say Mecca. I said, Dearborn, Michigan. Say, what's wrong with that? That is not the God of the land. And so you know what God did? God sent lions in. And, and let me show you a remarkable thing. Look at verse 33. They feared the Lord and served their own gods. Look at verse 39. But the Lord your God... Uh, ye shall fear, and ye shall, he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Howbeit, they did not hearken, but did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images. That is the only time that God ever allowed somebody to have him and a, foreign, uh, and a false god. But remember, those are the people that had the false god before they had him. What I'm telling you is don't think that because you've got the real god, you can now introduce a false god. But you know what he made them do? He made them worship him. Now, come on, guys. How are you going to mess with a God that can shut down a continent with one volcano? How are you going to overthrow a God that can rock Haiti and Chile and Japan and China and California and, man, he could lay one right here if he wanted to. Could he not? And here is what is going to happen. Here's what we see happening. I don't believe that God has judged America. I have people tell me all the time, you know, well, this is all the judgment of God and the Twin Towers was a judgment of God. I don't believe it's a judgment of God for this reason. When God judged a nation, it was never business as usual again. And I do not know, if you listened, 
be it college football or professional football, in this last season, I don't know how many times I heard this, in the midst of this horrible depression or, or recession we're in, how many times I heard, and a record crowd. A record crowd. Yeah. Guys, do you understand that when God's judgment's on a country, one of the things you're not going to hear about is record attendance at a college football game? You say, well, what do you think that is? What do you think of the Twin Towers and all the earthquakes and all the stuff that's happened in our country? You understand we're in a country now that one half of it is on fire and the other half is underwater? That one half of it is in flood stage and the other half is having a drought? You say, what could that be? That's lions. And these lions are God's lions. And I'll tell you why. God sends lions into a nation, a nation where he has been its God. And there's only two ever. Israel and this one. And I hate to tell you this, guys, but you can wrap your arms around every false idol that Hollywood sends your way. We could all leave this church and convert to Islam. It wouldn't matter. If every born-again Christian in this country turned to Islam tomorrow, God would still judge this country. And I'll tell you why he would. He'd still send the lines in because he is always going to be the God of this land. And they can kick him out of school and they can plug their ears to his commandments and they can say you can't have a national day of prayer and even the president can go pray with the Muslims. But the God of that book is still the God of this land. And you understand, he is not the God of this land because you and I made him that. It happened back at its inception and you can't make him the God of this land and you can't make him not the God of this land. And he is, if he is anything, he is a jealous God. And he will send lions. And have we not seen lions in our country? And it doesn't always have to be a big fire or an explosion or an earthquake. It could just be 90% of industry moving out of the country. Well, I mean, if I've seen anything in the last 10 years. You, you know, I was not a Ross Perot fan. But you've got to admit he was prophetic when he said the giant sucking sound of jobs going out of the country. And last 10 and 15 years, I pull into towns and a pastor, I'll be driving, driving down the street with him, and he'll say, you see that empty, that empty factory over there? 400, 400 jobs went to Mexico. Somebody, see, 800 jobs went to China. I mean, jobs have left this nation by the bushel basket full. You say, what is it? That's lions. Guys, I'm going to tell you, we, we need to be loyal to the God of this land, and the God of this book is the God of this land. And he's going to get his worship. He'll get his worship. But there's another lion. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 19. And man, I'll talk, you talk about a scary lion. This is a scary lion. Ezekiel chapter 19. And it says this verse 1. Moreover, take thou up a lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, What is thy mother, a lioness? She lay down among the lions. She nourished her whelps among young lions. She brought up one of her whelps. Now watch. It became a young lion and it learned to catch the prey. It devoured men. Notice this isn't just a lion that's already out there. This is a lion that, it actually said it became a lion. You know, you see a little boy and somebody's going to become what? A man. And you see a lion cub and I mean, even a lion cub that someday is going to be able to eat you is cute. Now, all I got to do is see the picture once. That's enough for me. But that cute lion, uh, lion cub is someday, it's a whelp. Someday it's going to be a lion. And what does this lion do? It became a young lion. It learned to catch the prey and it devoured men. You know what this lion is? You. This lion is you. You say, preacher, I'm not a lion. No, you're not. No, you're not a lion. So with a preacher, how am I going to become a lion? Real easy. Get mad at your preacher. You have any idea how many, not bad people, good people, got mad at their pastor and suddenly they, they learned to catch the prey. Hey, uh, Brother Doty, how about coming over for supper? And I have him over the house, you know, not, you know, I love our pastor. Yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned, you know, I, 
I mean, some of the direction he's been talking about taking the church, I mean, I, I, I just don't know that God is in it. Do you know there are no classes in a Bible college on church politics and there's no church that doesn't have them? Yeah. Now that tells me that just like, you know, there's no class on lying. Did anybody teach you how to lie? Every person in here, I said, every single one of you, you were lying before you could talk. Is that not true? There was a day when you were a baby, you were clean, you were dry, you were fed. Somebody's holding you, you're just happy as a lark, and then they laid you down in the crib and let go, and you went, ah, 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 and you screamed, oh, oh, something wrong. Ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. You couldn't even talk and you were lying, right? Nobody taught you that. It's natural. You know church politics, they're natural. Here's the problem. Once you become a lion, you'll die a lion. You'll die a lion. Let me tell you about a guy I had lunch with many, many years ago. He visited my church. He came with this preacher and he was a millionaire. Oh man, oh man. Baptist preachers love millionaires. Well, here's, here's why this is. I'm going to tell you why. We're the perfect team. We have the ideas and they have the money. And if they will just understand, they need to give us their money so we can carry out our ideas. This is all going to work great. And we got this down. It's they that have the problem, not always seeing this correctly. So I'm having lunch with this fella. And I'm, believe me, I'm not interested in a millionaire. I really am not. But um, we're having lunch. In fact, this was this guy's millionaire, so I, he already had, you know, he was already taken. <laughs> but if there's any millionaires that are on the, oh, never mind, he's already, they're, you're already taken too. Um, we're having lunch. And let me tell you what's happened. This poor millionaire had been, there had been about a half a dozen preachers try to tap him financially. Now, some of them were well-meaning. Really, they were well-meaning for that very reason. They had an idea, they needed money, this guy could give them the money, and we'll all live happily ever after. And some of them were just greedy crooks. So we're having lunch, and the guy is not bitter, but he's telling me about how this guy, I thought this guy was sincere, but he was just after money, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. And I'm having lunch, and here's what I said. I said, look, let me tell you something. I said, I, I, I don't discount anything you said. I believe everything you said is true, because I know Baptist preachers. And I said, um, I said, I think that every preacher you say has mistreated you has done that. I believe that. But I said, let me tell you the danger that I see here. You are in danger of, of becoming what we preachers call unpastorable. Here's what, this, here's what this millionaire said. He lived in a very large metropolitan area, big city. And he said, there is no, and there was no King James Bible, even Bible uh, Baptist church here. And he, at, at lunch there, he said, if I could find a man who wanted to come to that city, I would rent the building, rent his house, and pay his wages to start a church in that city. And I said, where's, where's that city? Where, I'm sorry, how, how much would you? <clears throat> well, I mean, just every now and then, still small voice. Um, <laughs> and I didn't hear it at all. And I told him this, I said, I said I, I said, I believe you're sincere. I said, I believe you could get you a young preacher out of a Bible college, pay his wages and pay for everything and, and start that church. But I said, you're on the verge of becoming unpastorable. And I said, here's what I mean by that. I said, you're gonna get this guy and somewhere after he's been there for a while, he's gonna do something that makes you mad. And you're gonna kill him. And I said, you think that I in, I'm trying to protect preachers. So you guys always think that we preachers are trying to protect our fellow preachers from you. And that is not true. I said, I'm not telling you this to protect a preacher because he ain't even there yet and I don't even know who he is. I said, here's the danger. You're going to kill this preacher. And the first one is the hard one. After you kill one, you'll disagree with the next one and you'll kill him easier and you'll kill the next one even easier. I said, and, and I believe this, guys, murder is a bad habit. You know what that guy did? He found him a young preacher. Rented the building, 
rented the house, paid the preacher, started the church, and it took off. It was doing great. It was doing great. I had numerous meetings there, and then one time we had a meeting, and, and we had this meeting. It was a Sunday through Wednesday, and I can still remember. We're, we're driving out of town Thursday, and I said, Kathy, oh, we had a relatively good meeting in that church. I said, Kathy, we just had a good meeting. But I said, there is something wrong in that church and this meeting did not take care of it. Now, the pastor didn't confide in me of any kind of a problem uh, and, and nobody else talked to me. But I said, I said, there is something wrong in that church and I said, this meeting did not take care of it and it is gonna split in six months. And I was wrong. It was three. And you know what the problem was? Daddy Warbucks was mad at the preacher that he, that he hired. And he eventually ran him out of the pulpit. Then he paid to have another preacher come in. And this one didn't last five or six or seven years like the first one did. Inside of one year, you know what's happening? The guy's standing behind the pulpit and Warbucks is sitting right out there heckling him from the pew during his message. Ran him off. Then he went, because he realized he couldn't trust God or man anymore, so he went and got one of his relatives and installed him in the pulpit and then ran him out. And the church isn't even there now. You say, what happened? Was that, that was a wicked man, wasn't it? No. Well, that was a good man. That was a good man that became a lion. And you think you can't become a lion but you're no different than him. I was at a meeting and that man was there. And, and one night, I can still remember this, after the service, now this guy knew, I, you know, I, I don't walk up to him and go, ah, bless God, it's sin. <laughs> I just stayed away from him. And, and one night, my son, who'd been taking care of the book table, walked up to me with a check from that guy for me for 500 bucks. Would you like a check for 500 bucks? I never found anybody yet that didn't want one. But this guy, this is a check from a lion. This is a check from someone who learned to catch the prey and devoured men. He was a man who had been in church and active and good. And now his sole goal was to destroy every preacher he met. You think I'm taking his check? But you gotta remember something too, I'm human. And I, I called my sons together because I want my boys to know how to do this. And I said, boys, I said, now you know what happened at that church. Yep. And I said, I can't take this check. And I said, tomorrow I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell this man I can't take his check. And you know what he's going to tell me? I'll tell you exactly what he's going to do. I mean, this guy really wouldn't care if I stood up and screamed in his face. I said, whatever I say, when I'm done, he's going to smile and say, okay, but keep the check anyway. And about that time, I'm going to go, well, <laughs> well, the devil's had it long enough. <laughs> so I took my pen, and I took the red side of the ink, and across that check, I wrote void. Now, when I wrote void across that check, you know what it was worth? It was worth about that piece of paper right there. And the next day, he's sitting here, you know, and I, I, before the service, I sat down in front of him, and I said, brother, I said, now you know what went on up at your church? And he said, yeah. I said, I'm not here to rehash any of that. I said, I just want to let you know I disagree with what went on and you were wrong and I can't take your check. That's all I said. And you know what he said? He smiled, most pleasant smile, and said, well, that's okay. Just keep the check. I said, really? <laughs> No, I said, well, brother, I already voided it. And when I said, they went, okay. I handed him back his check. You say, why, do, why don't you take that check? Because I don't want any money from a lion. And here's the sad thing. The preachers that he ran out of the pulpit all stayed in ministry and went about their business. He's the one that's out of church. He's the one that can't be trusted in a church. He is the one that will eat any preacher. 
I'm not telling you this was not a wicked man. This was not a man committing adultery. This was not a man on drugs. This was not a man that was a thief. This was a good, honest man who helped a church. But then got mad at his preacher. And once he became a lion, boy, I'll tell you what, they taste that blood and it is all over. You say, I'd never do that. You'll never do it until you're mad at a preacher. And once you're mad at a preacher because you know that you're right, you will be amazed at the most ungodly things you will do. I talked to a preacher one time, a young preacher. He was in a small town. And there was an older man in his church, a member of his church, who'd been saved longer than he had been saved. And he loved this pastor. And then one day the pastor said something that made him mad, you know, so he committed the unpardonable sin, sin unto death. And this man left his church, but that's not satisfied. They're never, they're never, they're never glad to, to leave. You got to destroy the place. And so he left the church and went around this little town, not just cutting the preacher up and telling his side of the story, but literally fabricating fictional things and saying this preacher did them. And this young preacher saw him downtown one day and he said, hey, hey, so I got to ask you something. He said, uh, I saw somebody the other day and they were telling me that you said that I had done this. And he said, I did. Now, now, you know, sometimes it's like you and I have an argument and we both have our, our view of the argument, but that wasn't this case. This something never happened. He said, well, that's the thing. He said, what you said never really happened. He said, I know. He said, no, you understand. He said, what you said was a lie, right? He said, yeah. And he said, if you think that's bad, wait till you hear what I tell them next. You know who he was? You know who he was? He was that young pastor's father. It was the father who had become the lion trying to eat his own son. Say, who would do that? Guys, we are all just as wicked as we can be. And every one of you is going to be made mad by your pastor or some preacher behind this pulpit. And look, I always say it this way. If you've been a member of this church for two years and he hasn't made you mad in two years, do this. And if you can find yours, check his. If your pastor doesn't make you angry in a, inside of two years, something is wrong. But when he makes you mad, you know what you need to say? Thank God. I need to say, well, you're just trying to protect him. I'm trying to keep you from becoming a lion. You will learn to catch the prey. And you will devour men. And, and murder is such a bad habit that you'll murder this pastor and you'll murder the pastor, the the next pastor. If you run him off, you'll run off the next one and you'll go to another church and eventually you'll turn on that one. You know why? Because murder is a bad habit and once you become a lion, all you want is human flesh. Don't become that lion. But there's one more. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. Get Proverbs chapter 22 and Proverbs chapter 26. Look at what it says in verse 13. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. Look at chapter 26, verse 13. The slothful man saith, there's a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. Who says the lion's in the street? Slothful man. You know what this lion is? This lion is absolutely imaginary. Doesn't even exist. This lion exists only in the mind of the slothful man. You know why? Because he's slothful. But who wants to be known as slothful? You know, well, I'd go to church visitation. Well, you don't want to go to church visitation. Let's just, why don't you just admit that you're cold and, and, and out of the will of God and you don't want to go to church visitation. No, you don't. Well, I don't think I'll be coming to church visitation preacher. See, I'm backslidden. I couldn't care if the whole world goes to hell. So you say, well, I would, but you know, there's, We've had some strange people around our neighborhood. I need to stay home because I'm afraid if I come to visitation, they're going to break in. Now all of a sudden, your carnality has become wise. And the slothful man, you know what the slothful man is going to do for God? Absolutely nothing. And he knows he's going to do absolutely nothing. And he knows everybody's going to know he's slothful. So he can't say, I'm going to do nothing because I'm slothful. So it's always, there's a lion out there. 
Preacher, I'd, I'd be there. You know, I was about to come and I was going for the car. I saw that line. Preacher said, you saw the line? Well, I, I saw the bush move. So I know he's there. Well, have you seen him yet? I, I, I've just seen him moving in the shadows at night. You have any idea how much has not gotten done because somebody imagined what would happen? I was telling somebody, I think it was right before service. Uh, you know, we Christians, we have a way of finding a cloud in every silver lining. And we can snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And there's nothing like a Bible-believing Baptist to find something negative and some, something to be afraid of in everything. And I was talking to this Christian, and he was telling me some, some fairy tale thing that he was afraid of, you know, and I said, well, we'll just do this. He said, well, if we do that, then this will happen. I said, well, then just do this. Oh, no, because then, then this will happen. I said, well, we can do this. He said, oh, then what if this happens? I said, I got an idea. He said, what? I said, let's just kill ourselves. I said, there's obviously no hope. I said, let's just kill ourselves. You first. <laughs> I've not asked your pastor about this. I don't have to. I could ask any pastor. Ask any pastor how many times he's been talking to somebody that had some kind of a problem. He said, well, here's what you need to do. And instantly they could tell him why they couldn't do it. Well, then take, do this. Oh, no, because then this would happen. You know, I, I'd, I'd expand my business, but then I'd make more money. Then they'd get more taxes. And we spend our life worrying about lions. I've never seen a group in my life Conjure up some kind of a lion. You know, they're listening to you on your phone. I, I, I had this happen many years ago. This is when communism was still around. And, and I'm, at this, I'm, at this, uh, I'm at this Christian function. And this guy comes by with a clipboard and a petition. And it was some kind of an anti-communist petition. And I read it. I said, hey, this is good. This is good. I'm going to sign this. And I signed it. And I said, wait a minute. I said, I know a guy. He hates commies. I said, let's go have him sign this. I took it over to him. I said, read this. He's reading it. He goes, man, this is good. I said, it is good, isn't it? He said, yeah. Oh, man, this is really good. I said, it's really good, isn't it? Yeah, this is really good. Oh, yeah, this is great. He said, boy, I hope this passes. I said, me too. I said, here, sign it. He said, no. I said, well, here, sign it. No. I said, well, don't you agree with it? Yeah. I said, well, then sign it. No. I said, why not? Because, brother, you sign that, you put your name and address on there, and when the communists take over, your house will be the first one they come to. And I said, that's, I said this, I said, that's why I signed it. Amen. I said, because I wanted to be on my front door and I don't want to give them the chance, give me the chance to craw dad like you just did. Yeah. Amen. And guess what? Communism fell and no, it never took over. Yeah. And how many times? Come on, how many times? I'll bet you there's people sitting in your favorite seat here tonight that when that preacher said we're going to build new sanctuary, you went, oh, brother. You know what's going to happen? It's going to halfway through, we're going to run out of money. And we'll never fill it. Right? Come on, you know that happened. You know why? Because it's always easy to see a lion. You know what I want to do? Hey, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. I'm, I'm with this preacher. And I like cars. You guys know I like cars. And, and I'm with this preacher and... Um, he had a 50 Chevy pickup truck, and it was no, it'd been out in the back 40 out west here, you know, and he's going to fix it up. And he said, uh, come out and look at it. And so I, he hadn't even looked inside of it, and here's what happened. I opened up the driver's door right on the floorboard in the driver's side was a rattlesnake. Coiled up. I said, what'd you do? Nothing. Nothing. I said, were you scared? No, not at all. So what'd you do? Nothing. Looked at it. See, all it was was the skeleton. That rattlesnake had coiled up there for whatever reason. It died, and it was literally, it was literally, it was like it was aiming right at that door for whoever opened up that door was going to get it. Had I done this maybe six months earlier, I wouldn't be preaching to you tonight. And you know what I wonder? I wonder if you're afraid of doing something for God because, well, you know, I'm afraid if I do this, then this will happen. And if I do this, then this will happen. And if we do this, guys, guys, you're never going to do anything. 
And then when we go up, the Lord's going to come back. And you know what some of you are going to say? Oh, Lord, 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 Lord. I, I know the rapture's happening. We're going to go up here. But, but I just want to see. What, I know that lion was behind that bush. Can I look behind that bush before I leave? The Lord said, yeah, I want you to look behind that bush. Sure enough, there it is. A skeleton of a lion been there for 20 years. It never was a threat. I knew a fella. He tried, uh, he tried to start a church. Failed. He tried to be the staff member of a church. Failed. He tried about five or six ministries. Failed at everyone and finally tried street preaching. You know, if you fail at street preaching, I mean, what do you do, man? There's always streets. <laughs> and you don't even have to get up a new sermon. He failed at that. And one day I'm talking to him and he said, you know, I'm going to be a missionary. I thought, oh, great, die on a foreign field. <laughs> And he went to the foreign field. It was one of the finest missionaries you ever want to see. You know, that guy failed, 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 failed. He failed about five different ministries. You know what those were? Every one of those could have been an imaginary excuse to stop him from going and being successful for God. Some of you may have tried something for God and failed. You are looking at a guy who will never criticize failure. I never criticize Failure. You know, we are Americans, and I love my country, but we are so sports-oriented sports that we look at the guy that doesn't win as a loser. You know, this guy, he faces the heavyweight champ of the world. They go 15 rounds. They're both barely standing when it's over, and it's a split decision. The champ keeps the title. And you say, see, he's a loser. Loser, he can whip every other man in the arena but one. I have no, I could, listen, you want to talk about, you want to be talking about being a loser? I can tell you how to lose, not thousands, tens of thousands of dollars publishing books. I have had, I have had tens of thousands of dollars stolen from me by born again Bible believers. I have made some, I have made some attempts that have cost me thousands of dollars. And I failed. You say, so what do you do? I tried it another way. So what happened? Failed. Finally, I hit one. I'll be kicked if I'm going to stop doing something because of what I'm afraid might happen if I start it. Now, I may fail. I would rather fail having tried something than sit in a pew, having done nothing but sit in my couch at my house and practice for the remote Olympics and succeed at that. And have somebody say, well, why didn't you come up? Well, there's lions. There's a lion. You guys, there's lions outside my house. I would have done something for God, but I, I mean, I don't want to get eaten by a lion, do I? The Lord's coming back one of these days. You know that? I don't want him, I don't want him to find me. I look, I would rather fail trying something than have him find me having sat at home safely because I didn't want to fail. Let me tell you about this and I'll be done. I talked to a pastor. There was a Marine base in his town. And that still small voice said, go by that base and see if you can have a chapel service for those Marines. So he goes by the base, he says, can I talk to the base commander? He talks to some liaison guy and he says, I would like to have a chapel service for the Marines on this base. And the guy says, okay, nice idea, but that is really the job of our chaplain and he has to okay it. You can have that if he says okay. And he said, uh-oh, the chaplain is a Roman Catholic. Well, Okay, I'll go in. So he said, I'm sitting in this office with this Roman Catholic chaplain. And this chaplain says, now, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I just like to come by about once a week or once a month. Can't remember just how it was going to work. But I'd like to have a chapel service where I could preach to the Marines. And he said, well, I'm talking to him. This chaplain looks at me and says, do I know you? He said, no. So have we ever met? No. He goes, you look familiar. And he thought, he seen me preaching on the street when I was preaching the Pope is a dope. <laughs> he said, ha 
haven't I seen you preaching on the street? Yes. No, that was my twin brother, the radical. I love everybody. He said, uh, <clears throat> yeah. He said, we need that here. You have your chapel service. How many lions do you think he got past? How many imaginary lions could he have said, that one will stop me, and that one will stop me, and that one will stop me, and he kept on going. Guys, Look, I am not a believer in the power of positive thinking. I do not believe there's a champion in everybody, and I do not believe that you can do anything if you just put your mind to it. I don't believe that. But what I do believe is that there's a lot represented by this crowd here that is never going to be done for God because you're never going to attempt it. And you're never going to attempt it because as soon as you think about it, you're going to think about the pitfall. You're going to think about the failure. You're going to think about people laughing at you and mocking you. And what are they going to say when I fail? And I just don't think I can handle that. I'll take the failure. I'll take the failure. I would rather try something and fail than succeed at absolutely nothing. And you have no idea what you could do for God if you just quit worrying about a lion doesn't even exist. And then the Lord's going to come back and you're going to see wasn't even there. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. The lions I spoke to you about are real. The roaring lion, the devil, he's real. The stalking lion, oh man, you go where he's at. He may have you. Enough of them have. God's line is real. And believe me, there isn't one person in this room that does not have the potential to become a lion and to learn to catch the prey and devour men. There's not one. You say, preacher, you said they're all real, but you said the imaginary lion wasn't real. Yeah, but if you think he is, he's as real as he can be. If he only exists between your ears, that's all he has to do to keep you from ever doing anything for God. You know what somebody ought to do tonight? You ought to come down here, get on your knees, and apologize to God for what you let scare you into doing nothing. You ought to come down to God and say, I am so sorry because you wanted me to do something, and all I could think about is what, what if and what will happen if, and oh my, what, what, about, what happens when this happens? You ought to apologize to God for being afraid of something that does not even exist. And then go out and do something. Father, thank you for your goodness. You are God. And you are greater than every lion there is. You really are. And Lord God, these are good folks. I mean, as people go, God, these are pretty good folks. And I like these people. I really do. God, we have no idea. We here have no idea who is in this room right now. We have no idea the successes that are sitting in these seats or standing where they are and we never will know those successes because some will let a lion that does not even exist stop them. God, we do not know who's standing here right now who someday will become a lion and learn to catch the prey and devour men. How sad to end their days with the blood of men. God, I pray for these people. Protect them from all these lions. Let them be wary of all of these lions and let us finish this race well. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, as the instruments play, if you need to come, why don't you come right now? Will you come and talk to God? This God is bigger than any lion. If you say, preacher, right now, I know the devil's after me, then you need to come and submit yourself to God. Don't try to resist the devil. Submit yourself to God, then resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I knew a guy had a crazy idea. He'd seen for sale signs and he thought if I put a scripture sign in the yard, wonder how that would work. 
And I don't know how many times the thought must have come to him, you can't do it because you can't afford it, you can't do it because you can't cover enough territory. His name was Malcolm Dickman. And you've seen his scripture signs. I have been up in the mountains in the Philippines driving down a back country road in the Philippines at midnight and go past a little Filipino shack with one of Malcolm Dickman's scripture signs in the front yard. Boy, I'm glad the lion didn't stop him. The measure of your character is what it takes to stop you. And what kind of character do you have if an imaginary lion can stop you? I guess it's imaginary character. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 393, 393. something tonight? Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Gip. That was good. 